Okay, so welcome also from our side to um, where our solution to this problem. We are the third prize winners of this uh, challenge. We, Simon Sander and I, we are studying here at ETH. We're in our master's degree in physics. So that's why probably our solution won't be as complicated as the solutions of all these network analysts here in this room. But, um, but still we try to make some kind of simple solution with an elegant theory, kind of. You will then judge if it's elegant or not. And, and since we're the first group, Simon will tell you now something about the problem, what really the problem was. Yes, so uh, the challenge for all those who don't know or don't remember um, was to distinguish the uh, the men and women's football game just by looking at tactics and technical features. So no uh, physical advantages or, well, obviously no player names or team names or uh, if features that were influenced by, for example, training facilities where men will be uh, advantaged because, the, um, because there's more money in it. And the, for the challenge, we used uh, the matches for from the last two World Cups, so from the Women's World Cup 2023 and the Men's World Cup 2022. So in total, 128 matches. Exactly. Um, uh, our, I'm going to quickly present our workflow, how we uh, approached the problem. At first, we tried to come up with some kind of theory or assumptions that we made. So how, how to distinguish between the uh, men and women's football. Um, we tried to, of course, then exclude all, all physical features and tried only to like look at how they tried and how they're playing and um, how one can measure actually this this playing style then. Afterwards, we did some data analysis to see if um, we could actually see this uh, in the data. Um, and as you will see, this uh, was the data quite supports our uh, assumptions. Um, but more on that later. Afterwards, uh, we prepared the data, we actually then implemented the, the nine workflow. So we read all the data into the uh, nine into nine and uh, prepared it. There we try to always look at the at the whole match at once. So one match is basically one on a row and not on uh, single events in the match. This was kind of a problem then because we only had uh, 128. Uh, 128 matches, yes. Um, so we had quite a small data set for, for a machine learning model. And mm -hmm. this uh, was kind of problem, which we will also talk about uh, later. And then at the end, we will show the results and the evaluation of these mod of the models we, we trained and what we could improve uh, from here on. Yeah, so we actually followed this kind of nine looking workflow here. And as we are physicists, we obviously always begin with the theory, right? So we always make some assumptions, try to do a, make a theory where we put this quite complicated problem, although it's, you would think it's quite simple, right? To somehow distinguish between men and women football. But as already Simo mentioned, we couldn't use any physical features and uh, physical advantages. And we also couldn't use any facility, training facility advantages. So uh, there's not like many factors left. And so we had to kind of put this problem into a simple form. And the first assumption that we made, which is maybe um, also a little trivial that like every every team in any sport like to kind of mimic the best team in their sport, right? So um, where is the difference between men and women football? Where in women football, it's quite 
USA dominated, well, in the past years, now with Spain as the winner of the World Cup, etc. But in the last years, it was quite uh, USA dominated. And in men football, it's quite European dominated. So we tried to put the problem of the differences of men and women into the problem of differences between US American women football and European men football. And European men football is quite inspired by Spain football, obviously. So we have kind of tiki-taka tactics in men football. So that was our theory. And the tiki-taka football is always characterized by those short passes, short times between the passes, and very fast plays. And now, what characterizes women's football in the US? Well, we thought about that kind of US American sports are always inspired by American football, and therefore they are more like kick and rush principles. So we tried to do longer passes, fewer passes, longer times between the passes. And that's why we compared actually tiki taka football and soccer, rough soccer. And so, as I already mentioned, we have short passes versus long passes. This is quite easy to extract from the data. And the number of passes is high in Big Taka football, and the number of passes is quite low in Rush football. And now, also something very interesting is obviously the accuracy of passes, right? So, in our theory, the accuracy of passes should be higher. In the tiki taka football, and it should be lower in the kick and rush um, tactics because I mean, shorter passes, right? So we have more accurate passes per pass, and in kick and rush, it's like longer passes, so the accuracy will be automatically lower per pass. And exactly, and then the last one, um, this one right here, so the number of duels. It's not maybe immediately visible why this is something that is different in those two tactics. And maybe one could also think that in Tiki Taka football, the number of duels should be higher. But, well, our theory was more that in, the, in uh, Tiki Taka football, the defenders try to be quite careful if they go into duels, because, I mean, if you play very fast soccer, then you don't want to get into a dual one versus one because the ball will be um, quite uh, fastly like played to another um, to another player. So you will get out, outplayed, and the number of duels in kick and rush will be higher. You try to cover the room, right? But you will uh, go on to the onto the player when he gets the ball, and this is not really the case here. Big tactical. Okay, so those were our differences, which we actually tried to compare and we extracted the data. Now, before we did the whole workflow in nine, we actually tried to analyze this first with um, some Python plots. And the first thing we did, is we analyzed the like, sort of passes. And this is like most, most probably the most difference here. So we had here a, a diagram number of matches versus pass completion rate. And you can see that obviously, um, well, if I would get now a data set right for a match, and I would get a completion rate of somewhere between uh, 84 and 85%, I would know it's probably a men's game. And if it would be around 70 and 71%, it would probably be a women's game. And this is quite a nice already, like uh, to this nice way to already distinguish between uh, those two. But obviously, we have an area here around seventy-eight to eighty-two percent where it's very unclear what it is. That's why we also have other factors in our other data which we uh, covered in our work. So I'm gonna now talk a little bit about uh, the. Workflow we did and actually in, in nine. 
So this here is the just the extraction basically of the of the data. So the data came from Statform 360, the 128 matches, and then we went through all the matches and um, we extracted the relevant features. So we already excluded all physically and uh, names, features, and so on. So and we only have uh, the relevant uh, features for our theory, and we we did write it in a, in a CSV file. And here, as I mentioned before, we um, did it for, like for every match. We did uh, then this like a one, one one column or one data point, you could say, uh, which was then kind of a problem. Um, well, this is probably this is the more interesting. Here is the next actually the feature extraction. So. We are reading the, the CSV files that we, we created before. And um, the Python script there uh, get, gets us the features. So we are extracting the number of passes, the number of incomplete passes. We are calculating the pass completion rates from this. Um, we get the pass length and so on, and the number of duels. Yes, exactly. And we limited then ourselves to, 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 to these features because there would have been other possibilities, um, which we will talk about in the, in the approve, uh, improvements. We we'll try to limit ourselves to, to do at the least number of features possible to avoid overfitting because the data set was, was quite small. Um, afterwards, so we did that for the men's and women's matches together, then we uh, put them all together in, in one match and we normalize to get a equal equal scale or equal range of the of the values. And then here is is the last part where we actually did the machine learning model training. So the blue button here on the on the left side left hand side um, they split the data set into training and testing data. We had I think 22 or 23 uh, tests in data, which is of course, uh, as I've mentioned, uh, quite small. Uh, the training, set of, training data was then um, feed that into the train, uh, machine learning training trainers. So we have three different models, a random forest, logistic regression, and a uh, gradient boosted trees learner. And the test that was then used for, for the prediction. Now, because you only had uh, 22 matches to predict in the test data, the evaluation has to be like taken with care because one match does quite make a, a big difference. And this is also why we didn't then finally decide for, uh, for one model, one specific model, uh, which would be best because all uh, three models predicted or uh, uh, got similar uh, accuracy scores of around 90, 99, 95%. So that will certainly be um, something that could be improved so that to very feed into uh, more data, um, yeah, which will Harry talk about in more detail. Yeah, so. Obviously, from our talk, uh, we can really conclude like more data would have been necessary to get like good accuracy and uh, good testing of our model. And um, I mean, only the fact that we had like three predictors and we couldn't really decide which one was the best simply really simply so we could take data from other tournaments, uh, women football or men's football. Um, but also to test our theory, right? So we, I mean, we had some assumptions to make, and some assumptions can only be tested if we have enough data. Uh, and this was not really the case, but that's why it was a challenge, right? So um, this was really uh, one improvement we can make. And the second one um, is also to explore like more differences in tick and taka and tick and rush tactics. We really think that our theory um it's quite elegant and um like nice to put into a workflow at night and that's why we also think that there are surely more differences to explore for example just only the time between the passes right 
the Tiki Taka football and kick and rush. In Tiki Taka football, the, the, the time between passes will be much, much shorter, and this will surely be also um, something uh, well to verify. And um, yeah, also, I mean, the, the passing patterns, right, which we learned in our soccer analytics course. Um, in Tiki Taka football, we would have like more of an ABA or ABCB uh, um, passing style. And in kick and rush, you really try to go very far with the ball, just with um, very few number of passes. So you will probably more go, go for a ABCD um, pattern. So with this, um, we conclude our talk. It's quite a short talk, but uh, I hope uh, you liked our solution. We're very much looking forward to the other solutions. Thank you very much. Are you willing to take questions? I am sure. <laughs> I have one question about this sort of like main assumption, which is that teams try to limit the best teams in their sport. Now, I was just thinking, I'm just remembering back to the Women's World Cup. I don't know how much you watched it, but I remember watching Germany and they crashed out. But I have I, the way I remember it was that, I mean, Germany is a very good team. They play quite nice football, I would say within the women's game, rather tiki-taka like Spain, somehow, I don't know. I'm looking at the journals now. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure, but um, what my impression is that many teams, when they play the good teams, are like parking the bus and then rather playing the long balls like kick and rush. Sure. I'm just wondering, do you have anything to say about that? Like how- Yeah, you absolutely. Make... I mean, we could also, I mean, also explore like, I mean, we didn't know who really played, right? So we knew that there was a match and it was a women's match in the FIFA World Cup. I mean, we knew it, but uh, we didn't uh, put it in our data. And if we would like distinguish between matches between good teams, like two good teams or a bad team versus a good team, then you would surely see that this bad team, I guess, would uh, do more of a tiki-taka. Right, but we just did our assumption like to kind of take an average of overall uh, overall place, and we think that there are like more um, more games where it's quite equal and not really like I don't know Ecuador versus USA, but, and um, so it was more like averaging. But that's a very good point. This uh, this would surely be. Uh, also one, uh, well, yeah, this will surely also cover our assumption if, I mean, we would distinguish between those two, yeah. And maybe I have a follow-up, yeah. which is somehow related, but somehow very different. Because there's often this, is people often saying the tournament football is different than league football. I don't know if you've heard that argument before. Um, that basically, in a tournament, the most important is that you don't concede goals, basically. So you have, have a strong defense, and then maybe on the counter attack, try and snatch a goal if you can. I'm wondering, I don't know, what's your, like, do you have an expectation about that? How it would be? Would you have a different approach if you would apply it to a league or a, or a tournament, say, for set? I mean, the good thing about this challenge was that it was, I mean, there were two tournaments. Oh, yeah. So, uh, the two tournaments to compare, but if you would now compare like a league match of women between a, to a league match, to a tournament match of men, well, you will probably have to kind of, I don't know, tell our workflow that, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of difficult to really implement this, I think. So, Yeah, I mean, you can also look at the goals, maybe. If we have like, more goals, it's more probable to be a number of goals to like detect it, whether it's a league match or a, or a, yeah, maybe one workflow just to detect whether it's a league match or a tournament match. But uh, this would be quite complicated, I think. But maybe you have 
better solution. <laughs> but yeah, but that's a good point. Yeah, surely. But obviously, it was uh, it was quite nice that we had like two tournaments and two quite equal tournaments, right? So two world cups. Mm -hmm. So we had also bad teams, but we had the best teams. There is a question online. Um, can you detail a bit about the technological stack used for the project and they uh, give you kudos for the nice presentation? <laughs> the technological stack that you use for this work. Okay, so, well, we, we try to, uh, as I mentioned, we try to like get uh, the, the, some features that were um, important for the distinction between, between the two. And then we, we try to feed them into the, into the machine learning model and look at the outcomes. Um, I think I, I, which, which tool do you use? So you use Python and I. Yes. Yeah. So oh, I think that's, that's what they're asking. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, we only use the Python one yeah, to Python. like average over um, over the matches, but to get some average number of tests, we use awesome decision rate and all this stuff because it's not really extractable from the data immediately. Probably there is non workflow to do that, <laughs> but um, as we already mentioned, yeah, it was maybe the easiest way to do so. Can I ask one more question? So, sure. so you said that more data would help you, but on the other hand, your, as you self-declared, elegant theory <laughs> um, is, is like a single, single reason explanation for the distinction. So do you really think that more data would help you make more accurate distinctions? I think not more accurate, but we would be able to uh, identify uh, which model actually performs best because we have like the, the accuracy is is, uh, is clear that that yeah, model. So what if the separation between the two sets is not so clear? Then it doesn't help to have a better model. It's just not, it's indistinguishable using the explanation that you're applying. Yeah, I, I don't know, perhaps the, it won't, won't help, yeah. Um, I just I just I, hear yeah. this expert or this um, this request very often. That I need more data, but it's not always clear to me whether more data is actually. I mean, more data would be helpful just for testing, right? I mean, just for testing purposes it would surely be more uh, an advantage, just because we have three predictors, and if those three predictors get tested more on our data, our our theory, then we would know which one of those predictors would be better. Simple as that. <laughs> I think actually, from the data set uh, that provided uh, everything from that, you can track to many features. It could lead to hundreds of features. And then, when the features, number of features are bigger and the number of data points, then it's pretty important to figure out uh, the level of traffic. Right? So, in that case, having uh, more um, data points on match is necessary. That's a more complicated explanation than using more features. And here, yeah. the explanation was rather restricted right, to, well, to several features. Just on two more things. This is actually how they So, if you like see things at a bigger picture, then it's possible to extract more um, features. Then. And that's why I think it doesn't work in that this is my idea. There is one more question. Yeah, it's also, uh, I mean, there's a lot more data. For example, here, if you would like would add another World Cup to it, I think it would add more noise to it than it would uh, like add signal to it because, like, uh, the two, the Fumi Saka and the Fumi Saka are sensible. They evolved so much over the four years that uh, the results probably would get like that clear than if they would like. But you could also use like qualification, I don't know, World Cup qualification. Yeah, yeah. That, that probably would have, but like if you would take another time, it would probably cost like a problem. Okay. Excellent. Good.
No more questions? Yeah, there is nothing. Okay. Thank you. And yeah, if you want to show to the camera. <laughs> so we were we we appreciated when we did the evaluation of all these projects. Uh, your project was appreciated because of the uh, comparison of the different um, algorithms and so uh, and the implementation that was uh, relatively elegant. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm a single member team, so I need to <laughs> both do this and present at the same time. Um, my name is Anne. Um, I'm, today I will introduce to you guys my solution for the um, soccer analytic challenge, which is basically uh, focused on leveraging the data um, that uh, we provide, uh, it's worth provided. So uh, whenever it's come to a challenge, I always asking myself that, am I in the right track? So um, by um, asking that, I can first see the goal and then um, formulate it in a very uh, familiar way. So the goal of the challenge is actually to develop a classifier involving uh, a simple task, it's just uh, assigning the label for each match is if it man or if it male is a female. And um, we can actually form formulate a problem into a very familiar task, which is just binary classification problem. But the thing is not easy like that, because initially I was thinking it's just a, okay, it's just a classification thing and it's maybe not that difficult. So I figured out different challenges in this challenge. Uh, three main part is, first of all, the number of uh, data points very limited as uh, introduced in the previous presentation. Um, and to come up uh, to handle this problem, I tackle it uh, by uh, using uh, leave one out cross validation um, method to ensure the, the performance of the classifier Erebus. Uh, the second challenge is that um, we don't have a really uh, ready to use data. So uh, in every single match, there are more than 10,000 events were recorded, but you don't really have a, a features. Um, like, I mean, the column, you have a row, but you don't have a column. And um, what you need to do is actually extract it um, so in my solution, I introduced uh, 30 novel uh, features through the feature engineering uh, stage. And um, last but not least, the main path is to build up a classifier, but it's not only to focus on the accuracy or because it's a um, binary classification. So I assume that uh, accuracy and F1 are the same. Uh, yeah. So um, the challenge here is to a classifier that um, yield a great performance with accuracy and also easy to understand, easy to interpret. Um, so uh, the solution uh, is that I use a mix of linear regression, three vector and Gaussian process for uh, diverse model. In the next uh, step, I will introduce, uh, I will tell you why I use Gaussian, Gaussian process. Okay. So um, after the um, brainstorming stage, um, I uh, build up a um, pipeline. Uh, it's a very popular pipeline. Just first extract the um, features and modeling and then try to see the performance of the classifier and um, analyze the feature importance of the, uh, of the model. In the first stage of uh, feature extracting, uh, I propose 30 different features which grouping into five main groups represent for different information about fall and pass. Second group is about tactical shift and substitution. Uh, third one is just measure the overall intensity of the match. Uh, the fourth is represent for the pressing strategy in the match. 
And the last one is um, short picture group, which uh, show uh, the information about the uh, short work executed by player. And I have um, at, uh, said before, this is the most important stage because you don't have a data set and you need to propose uh, the feature yourself. Uh, I come up with 30 features by a lot of assumptions, like what they say. Uh, actually, it's just come up uh, at the beginning a little bit intuitive, and then later you also add some sort of assumption. For example, in the first um, group of features which measure the um, fall and pass information. Um, there are, of course, a lot of more than three, but I just um, pick out three of them. For example, the number of fall committed in that event, uh, the assumption could be the more um, fall committed, maybe that's a uh, female or that could be a male. I mean, that's kind of assumption. Uh, and the number of offensive event and Um, with this kind of feature group, I also measure the um, pass angle mean by aggregating the um, mean of the pass uh, angle. In the tactical shift and substitution um, feature group, uh, some of them are the number of player substitution in the whole match and the number of substitution in the last 30 minutes, this means um, the number of player was substituted in the last, um, in the second period. Uh, there's normally two reasons why they substitute the player in the last sec second minute, last minute of second period. Uh, that could be because the player is too tired. But it's also, most of the time, it's because uh, the coach actually wants to shift the, uh, the strategy of the match. And uh, that's why I also uh, merged two of them, which is tactical shift and substitution in the same group. Um, the third, the third uh, feature group is measuring overall intensity of the, uh, of the match, which is uh, duration of total event, irregular play event, or the number of goalkeeper event. Um, this also a very common term in football. Uh, people always care about pressing. So um, I think pressing is quite important. And uh, I come up with different features in that um, feature group, which is number of defensive event, number of uh, bone recovery event, or number of under pressure event. Last but not least, um, the group short feature group measure measuring the information measuring or represent information provided by um short was executed by player. So there that's the group that I spent the most of the time, but the result wasn't that positive. You will see it later. Uh, and uh, I measure the location of the short from the short from the short way it start to the goal, uh, and also do other statistical number with um, shooting technique and uh, counting photo shot pattern. After, after extracting all the features, I also executed a general correlation analysis. And through this um, uh, matrix, it could easily see that there are several um, group of features that have a very strong correlation to each other, which is can potentially reduce the number of features in this stage. But um, I didn't do this uh, experiment. And I just you it can also use uh, Gaussian process or lasso to to uh, mitigate this um this concern this problem. Um, in the second stage modeling, so in um, we have a data shape of so now the data is ready to fit into the classifier to train a classifier, um, the model. 
So uh, data shape right here is 128 row uh, represented for 128 match in 30 features. Mm, I didn't do much with data processing, just normalize it um, and split it into the array of 1730. In case of um, the last uh, experiment, I also used a uh, lead one LCB. Uh, in that case, the uh, number of coder is five. Um, three model was implemented is decision tree, Gaussian process, and uh, logistic regression for the sake of um, interpretation, actually. So, in the table one, yield the um, result of the performance of three different models. Um, Logistic regression yield the highest mm, performance when common. And then after that, I also use um, lead what LCV for logistic regression and the performance um, increase unto 93% of accuracy. By performing the um, PCA, we can also see that the data is quite separate. Uh, the um, Fuchsia point represent for um, match by female match and the one is uh, male uh, football match. Um, that's, uh, you can see that in the um, uh, space, they are very separated. So it's understandable why the um, model are all yeah, really decent performance. All of them are greater than 85%. In the last part, um, I also implement the, also did the feature importance to see how these features participate, uh, participate to the, the model itself. In uh, some of them, most of them are uh, from pressing uh, feature group and also fall and pass group. Yeah, so we come back with the, uh, the example that I show in the second slide, the color um, text is actually in top A important features. So it can um, we can conclude that for example the fall and pass feature group and tactical shift as a substitution play a very important role in classify if the match is man or woman football. Meanwhile, as I said um, before I spent a lot of time on extracting the features of the short. But in the end, through the um, uh, feature important, um, they don't really play uh, any big, uh, they don't play an important role in, in classify, uh, in the um, classifier. And the weights are very tiny, close to zero, I mean, um, yeah. So, when I did uh, my research design, I also has other idea. I have more features to work on, but then uh, there was just one month and I didn't make it happen. And also there's another direction, which is very uh, potentially is that using uh, temporal analysis. Mm. Yeah, by um, there's another folder a file named 360 frames. Every uh, frame is actually represent the location, longitude and attitude of every single player. You can use CNN or any kind of graph neural network or something to represent that frame and link them together, become a time series. So um, instead of having 128 row with 30 column, um, column you have a 128 time series. And then from there, you can actually uh, build a temporal analysis. 
that's in my idea at the beginning, but then I um, run out of time with 30 features. <laughs> So yeah, um, something about technical aspect with Clang. So it's a part of the game. Uh, I need to implement everything using Clang. Uh, I'm quite familiar with Python. I'm, I'm familiar with Python. So of course, I challenge my, myself by uh, try to do no code implementation. I just use the software itself. So um, I think it's very good for people who doesn't know code with this uh, software. Um, but it leads to uh, this advantage from, from my workflow is that I need to use uh, almost 400 nodes and it's really huge. Uh, and then uh, I need to work on how to um, change a figure, um, figuration. Um, yeah, and you actually can do that in case you. Uh, you need, I actually also introduce it in my workflow. Yeah. It's possible to change the configuration. Um, there's another option with Nine uh, is that you can also uh, use uh, extension. By using extension, uh, you can also save some time to um, desire um, uh, a, a part. For example, I uh, measure the location of the short to the goal 2D, and I also measure uh, location the distance from the short to the goal 3D, and I all use the uh, extension named Geospatial Analytic Extension. It's really interesting if someone needs to work on geographic data. Yes. This is the last part. It's just uh, how my workflow look like, but it's just one ten of it because it's really huge. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't really okay, maybe so nervous today. So yeah. <laughs> Any question, feedback, or even question. collaboration? There is a question online. Q and A. A no, follow okay. up question to the above question. No, there is the first one. You mentioned using Fire yeah, that one. Yeah. So I will. You can read the other one. So put the yeah, the people at home, they don't see that. I should read it. Shall I read it? Okay. You mentioned using foul committed events and offensive events used for foul and pass feature group. Are these events by default considered as faults per se, or were purposeful faults taken into account? For example, when a player commits a fault to avoid a goal. Um, actually, uh, this data were annotated already. So I don't really know how a staff form consider in the case of someone try to commit a fault to avoid a goal. What does it consider? I just um maybe professor could uh, explain on this if you really understand the data set. <laughs> because actually the uh, this question should for the annotators, not for person who analyze the data. So I think it's really interesting question. But it's just I don't have an answer. So there was no yeah. distinction between foul, purposeful foul, irregular events. They were all fouls in the annotation. I guess so, but I'm I'm not the person who annotated, so I cannot say. So that answers also the same question. Yeah. Oh. That says a, a follow. Yeah, a follow up question. Can we consider the purposeful, purposefully made fouls? in the category of irregular events in play, if not, what were some of the irregular events in play? I actually uh, need to read it. I prepared this because I know that I will not remember 30 features that I extracted. <laughs> it's um irregular event play. So it's in intensive, right? Mm -hmm. So actually, every single event in in the event list 
they will annotate it with um, different category. Most of them, majority of them are marked as um, regular. So I just use sum and minus for regular, so it becomes irregular. So if get irregular could be freaky, throw in uh, counters or etc. <coughs> I hope I answered uh, the questions. Yeah, I mean, but also if you have uh, any yes. other um, questions uh, deeper, just email me. I will happy to answer. Any <laughs> questions here? Yeah, sure. I have a question. I can't remember now all of your teaching. Like neither neither you nor your. Yeah, I I will, many, but... I will can come back. Uh, yeah, I I I have one in my mind. So pressing, for example. You mm -hmm. said the pressing, where is it? Okay, but it was not significant. Maybe I look at something else. Um, I don't know. I think actually I, I stick with the pressing because it's illustrating the point. So I would I would have thought that this is somehow linked to physical differences between the sexes. And I was wondering, did you consider that when you implemented the features? I know that I cannot use any features related to physical and biological difference between men and women. Mm -hmm. Uh, I do aware of this actually, but then um, I still say this is kind of difficult. Okay. Pressing, you think that uh, the ability of run fast a woman different to men, so they cannot do that. Um. I wouldn't put it in terms of ability, but I think that there are there are there are differences between biology that um that are meaning that endurance like endurance is different. Endurance levels of men and women are different. Pressing is requiring a lot of energy to constantly run after the ball or run and defend. This kind of controversial That's question controversial. because, like, let's say for example, pass angle mean. You can also there's not no uh, statistical number, but I mean if someone give assumption that men can maybe play strategy better and women just kick ahead, that's it. Actually, what happened? A friend of me suggests me that women always just kick to the goal, and men is like more like zigzag thing. Mm -hmm. So I mean that's it. Kind of if someone try to discuss, try to convince people that. Mm, Biological thing, or well, I guess the question was not. I'm not claiming that it's hundred percent biological or not, but I was wondering. I mean, yeah. did you take any steps to ensure that your features are not biased by biological features of the sexes, or did you did you I, did you I, think that all your features were completely? I assume it. You assume that. Yeah. So I think probably in order to make it better, which is maybe my approach, like. Just do massive, propose a lot of features. And then after that, you see which one is like really important for the classifier. We will consider again if that one is um is actually a philosophical or biological thing different between men and women. And then if it's see, then we delete it. Mm -hmm. So in that case, we will come up with a lot of more features. Otherwise, if you just come up with a beginning 10 and then think a lot about this is I think it's it's correct way to do it. it's safer, but it's not efficient in my case for one month. I mean uh, for me the first four are okay to what like the the physical differences um really matter. But the short intro group, I'm not quite sure what was really your I mean you said it was much intuition intuition into it, but like shot to goal distance for me it's like okay, maybe men have like more power in the shots. Yeah. And that's why the shot to goal distance is much higher for men football. To be honest, I also measure the average yeah. of the shot of women and men, but then in the end I didn't write down here. I don't see much different, honestly. Okay. But yeah. And then you see everything, it's just I think we should come up with some startup paper that if it's really different in the short, uh, start where the shots start and to the goal. So, so you, you've shown us all the features, and you've also shown us that you can, you can classify with very high accuracy, and which of the features are important. 
But now if your uncle asks you what are the differences between men's and women's football, what would you answer? I would answer. Probably not given the list of features. Oh, for example, <laughs> the if the the number of committed souls. Oh. I mean, so I, you, you didn't tell us which direction those features go. Yeah. And, and how you would summarize the difference there. I just know that the more, uh, let's say, for example, the number of foul committed event, the, if there's more that kind of event happen, then it's high probability is a match of men. That's what I guess. It's unpleasant as it may be. <laughs> no, it's also due to simulation. <laughs> Not all problems are problems. Before the presentation, I did think about this question also myself. <laughs> yeah, so let's hope your uncle calls on me next week. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have an uncle. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> that's why. <laughs> uncle. Anybody else? Online? <laughs> no, online. There are no more questions. Okay. Okay, then. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Zior. And uh, we enjoyed, uh, when we were evaluating the projects, we did enjoy the creativity uh, that you put in creating more and more features. It was it was nice to see the, yeah. the proliferation of features. <laughs> Maybe you had to zoom in like yeah, well out. about the implementation you can recycle, right? You can include uh nodes inside a component and then becomes like a function in Python. Anyway, but this one is it's okay. So the, we did enjoy the, the creativity in the process, definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. And now the presentation by the winning team. Uh, Thank you. Hi, I'm Gordana. This is Ivana. This is Hari. Uh, we are three PhD students of the Social Network Lab of EDH and our fourth team member, Kshirinja, uh, can't be unfortunately here in person, but she's uh, joining online. And we're all interested in football. We played or some even still play football. So when we heard about this challenge, we were curious whether we could distinguish men's and women's football only based on uh, technical and tactical features. Uh, first, we want to give you a brief context of history, but through the lens of the sector. So in 1863, the official laws of the game were stated, although of course the history of football dates back way further. It was played by both men and women, and what was also fostering the popularity among women was that um, men were sent to the first world war. The women were required to work um, in factories and took over this um, kind of not tradition, but the pattern to play football during the lunch break. And one of these factories were Dick, Kerr, and Co. And their uh, women's football team uh, are the Dicker Ladies. And to see that kind of the popularity was quite similar, both for men and women, if we look at the maximum record of attendees, um, which was in 1920, around 53,000 for the female uh, team of the Dicker Ladies, while um, the maximum record for a men's team, Burnley um, FC, was in 1924 around 55,000. <clears> so this was kind of quite a similar crowd watching men's and women's football. But then in 1921, the English Football Association banned women's football, stating that the game of football is quite unsuitable for females. And it was not only England, um, it was also 1955 that the German DFB imposed a ban, saying that in the fight for the ball, female grades disappear, body and soul are inevitably damaged, and the public parading of the body is offensive and indecent. And what these bans meant was that every club part of the um, football association wasn't allowed to have a female team, 
They were also not allowed to play against female teams. And they were also not allowed to give female teams their training grounds and their stadiums. So from one moment to the other, this entire opportunity for women's football to kind of gather public attention was simply gone. And only in the 1970s, these bans were lifted. And uh, there were many more countries imposing these bans. Uh, it was England, France, Germany, Brazil, Belgium, Spain, Denmark, and even more. But from that period on, um, women's football could finally start to grow. And nowadays, uh, we can see this rising public attention for women's football. But what we also see are these recurring gender debates, for example, addressing the um, investment gap, the different prize money for tournaments, the gender pay gap of players, but also of coaches, and also discussing the quality of men's and women's football. And regarding this last point, there is quite some work um, has been done on that, differentiating between men's and women's uh, football. They are based on different data sets from the World Cup, from the Champions League, um, some even consider data from, from youth leagues. And they are based on, um, they take different methods, logistic regression, decision tree, neural networks, and more. But maybe to summarize a bit, what they find is that men cover a higher total distance. They cover more distance at higher speed. They pass faster. They have longer team possession. Their possession starts more often in, in their own half. They perform better um, on receiving the ball. Men have more shots after individual play compared to team play. They have more ground duels. They have more crosses and they have uh, more successful process. But what they do not consider um, all of these work that has been done are the physical differences. And it's obvious that there are physical differences between men and women. Uh, so here you can see a table uh, of some differences specifically important for football. So one um, difference which is, I would say, quite well known, is that the endurance of women is lower than that of men. But it's also um, reasonable to take this into account that the endurance can have an impact on the distance covered. And then it might be not any more so surprising that men are covering a higher total distance. Or if you um, consider the lower leg strength, which is for women lower than for men, um, it can also have an impact on the speed of the passes. But it's not only these kind of features, but also there can be tactical features which, um, which are different based on physical differences. So knowing that men have a higher endurance, um, a coach can say to the men's team to press more because they can run more. Um, so the endurance can also have an impact on the pressing behavior of the team. And then the pressing behavior, again, can uh, lead to um, for the, the need for faster passes. So all of these aspects are interrelated because football is a physical game. And um, I think one main point, because we discussed it a lot, was for, for us a conclusion that controlling for these physical differences is simply not trivial. Um, so we came up with some features, um, but these features are also kind of um, dependent or were dependent on the data we were given. And with that, I want to hand over to Hardy talking about the data. So for this competition, we had access to a Statform 360 event data uh, from the last World Cups, both for women and men. In total, we had 128 matches uh, for each on-ball action. We knew who took the action, where on the pitch, and what was the outcome. But we also had more information uh, for the moment that there was an on-ball action on the pitch. We knew all the visible players of the TV footage their location on the pitch. Of course, it's not a full tracking data, so we don't have the information of the players who were not visible on the TV footage, 
And when we come, want to create features related to the team formation or the team shape or anything that was related to the collective behavior, where we needed the coordinates of all the players on the pitch, that was where we couldn't really go forward. And that was maybe one limitation of the data set we had. So to control for the physical differences, we can divide our pitches into two groups. The first part is the features that we think are unbiased uh, uh, when it comes to the physical difference. So we don't have any explicit control for, for that, except from maybe normalizing what, uh, over the match time, match length, and the total number of events in that category. So if you look at the right table, we have a variable and we have a ways that we have implemented that variable into features. The first one is fair play. And for fair play, we have three features. The total number of cards, yellow and uh, red, which is normalized over match length, the number of holes per match length, and also the mean time of stops in the play. So when a ball goes out of the play until the time it takes for the true inning, we are looking for that time and taking the mean uh, as a feature. The next feature is miscontrol, where we are considering the percentage of miscontrol passes, the same for miscommunication and the clearances and forward play. For sh shot timing, we have two features. The first uh, time that we had a shot in a match, the percentage compared to the match length and also the last shot on the match that's uh, calculated the same. And the last feature from this category is expected goals. Uh, for the ones who don't know what's expected goals, it's just a model that gives a goal probability to each shot. And that's provided by the provider stats form. And we are just taking the average number to, to consider as a feature. Next, we have features that we think are biased because of the physical differences. And we have two ways uh, to uh, address them. The first one is, maybe we can condition those features on the physical differences. So if you just consider like a passing accuracy, we know that there are different types of passes. For example, you have a ground passes, you have a high passes, uh, but maybe if you only look at the ground passes where the physical difference is uh, less, uh, so you don't need really a power to kick the ball long. Uh, and look for the accuracy and condition that with it, when it was under pressure and when it was done under pressure and to consider these two features separately, that's where you can address uh, physical differences relating to pressing in the men's games compared to the women's games. And the next feature is a shooting accuracy. So we know that uh, uh, there are long range shots uh, that we can uh, uh, maybe men uh, take more than the female and how we can address that is that if we only limit ourselves to the shots that have been taken from the penalty box. And the last two features are goal kick style and duels where we are interested in the behavior of the players. So that's why we are, uh, uh, let's say, taking a related number compared to the whole uh, ground passes goal kick keepers had and also looking for the percentage of one duels. Uh, I think uh, now it's time for Shitija to continue the nine workflow. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, so as you can see on the screen, we have an implementation, which can broadly be divided into three categories. The first one, uh, should I wait or is this fine? Go for it, go for it. Sorry. Okay, cool. Yeah, so as you can see on the screen itself, uh, our NIME implementation <coughs> can be divided into three parts. The first one being data ingestion, then followed by feature collection, and then finally the classification model. So in the data ingestion part, uh, it's mainly just reading the data files which we have, uh, where each file describes one match, uh, which can be a women's match or a men's match. Um, followed by feature collection, a uh, feature calculation where we are doing the main feature extraction things. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? Yeah, so uh, in the feature calculation part, uh, we have mainly three categories of features. The first one being style of play, then technique, and then fair play. Fair play is uh, mainly about, um, let's say, rate of fouls or cards and so on. 
Then technique is more about like the technique of the game itself. Uh, for example, miss controls or ground pass success rate and so on. And then we also have a style of play. So for example, in forward pass, uh, it it uses angles the pass is made at to figure out uh, what the value of this feature should be. So uh, these are three broad categories which we divided our features into. But to get these features uh, in the first place, uh, we had to short, we had to narrow them down from another big list of features which we had. So on the right, you can see a correlation matrix where the row and columns highlighted with the red border is the target variable called female. And all the other columns and rows are the features which we initially extracted. Now, if we look at the first cell of the female row, the, uh, the 0 0.62 value, this essentially means how much the feature called rate miscontrols correlates to a target variable called female. So yeah, this is how we get this matrix in the first place. And then using uh, using this matrix, we, we were able to figure out which features are more important to our target variable and which are not. So for example, in this female row, you can see that some of them are um, highlighted in more red or more green, whereas some of them are very faint, like yellowish shade. So those yellow ones uh, are the features which we did not want to include because they were not really uh, correlated to our target feature, uh, to our target variable a lot. And another uh, possibly interesting thing which you might see is um, on the right, we have a green box of four cells, uh, which uh, tells us that the features ground pass success pressured and ground pass success unpressured, they are also very highly correlated to each other and also to the target uh, to the target variable female. So in this case, uh, we did not see any point of adding of having both of these features when they are trying to tell us the same thing. So as a, as a result, we had to make a choice and we only considered the feature unpressured because it was more correlated to our target variable. So yeah, by shortlisting from this correlation matrix, we were able to get the features which you see on the left. Um, now coming to the actual model part. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so now that we have the features, now we uh, it's the time for, to use those features in a classifier. So in our case, we were experimenting with many different types of classifiers, be it logistic regression or decision trees or even neural networks. And all of that was done using the AutoML node enzyme itself, which kind of makes it, makes it easier because we don't have to implement different uh, type of models separately. Uh, now using that node, we observed that for all of these models, like at least the best ones, the accuracy which we were getting was very similar. It was something around 90% for all of them. So it didn't make sense for us to go with something more complicated like neural networks, which we might not be able to explain as compared to something as simple as logistic regression. So for this interpretability and the simplicity, we decided to go with the simple logistic regression model and use the features which we calculated earlier. Now in this model itself, uh, we since the data since based on the data we had we could get around twenty to twenty five um, test points like test data points so to say, and it is possible that by tweaking only uh, like by getting a different result for one point we can get a high variation in the accuracy the final accuracy so for example if uh, something was misclassified earlier and it gets classified um, in the correct way in in one of the runs the accuracy metric would change by about four about four points, which seemed a lot. So that's why we also employed a uh, five-fold cross-validation, which in the workflow you can see uh, is being implemented using X partitioner and X aggregator NIME nodes. Uh, and along with that, we also use normalizer to normalize our data so that it is scaled to comparable levels. And yeah, so that is how we get our ML pipeline in general. And um, now I would like to pass it on to Ivana who will discuss the results which we got using this. Thank you. Okay, so we've told you about our process, we've told you about our model, so what are the results? Um, so if we look at all the features that we considered in our logistic regression, what we see is that we have three statistically significant features, um, which are the mean stoppage time, which is telling us that um, there is a tendency for um, men's games that have a larger mean stoppage time, um, which is a little bit pointing to the usual stereotype that women play more fair and that men like to waste time and pretend they are more injured than they are and win fouls. 
So that seems reasonable. <laughs> um, and then linking to that, still on the topic of fair play, we see that there is a tendency for um, there to be more yellow and red cards um, given out within men's matches than in women's. And finally, we see that there is a tendency for a higher pass success rate for unpressured ground passes within the men's game. Um, so just one step back. So we, we spoke earlier about, we have these three different types of features. We have fair play, what we see, that seems to be playing quite a role here. We had um, technical features. Again, we see that reflected in terms of the past success rate. And we'd also talked a little bit about style of play, so tactical things like, um, for example, what kind of what kind of goal kicks you take? Do you play out from the back or do you rather go long stylistically? And what's interesting is that we didn't have any significant um, features, statistically significant features that were related to style of play, which is actually quite amazing because it, it tells us that the women's and the men's game, after controlling the physical differences, which of course plays a role, um, they are more or less the same in terms of the way that they are played. There may be differences in terms of fair play or in terms of technical levels or in, in terms of te technical progression of the games, but in terms of the way the game is played itself, um, it's not contributing much to our results. Okay, so that's the model, that's the model results. And what about how can we um, assess the model performance? So we use accuracy, as Chitra already told us about, in the five fold plus validation. We achieve an accuracy of 90% roughly. What does it mean? Um, well, if, if men's and women's football matches after controlling for physical differences were identical, we would expect roughly 50% accuracy. So our features, our model is providing an extra 40% accuracy on top of what we would expect the things are all the same. So that's somehow nice or not, depending how you want to interpret it in terms of what it means for men's and women's football. Um, but I think more important, which is how we try to frame the whole project and the whole presentation, is what does it really mean? Like, we can tell between men and women's football, even after controlling for physical differences, but what is that telling us? What does it mean? And what are we meant to do with that information? So I think it's good to take a step back and return to the beginning, <laughs> not just of the presentation, but of women's football itself, right? Because we, are, we argue that the way to interpret our results is that the non-physical differences that we that we see our model is picking up, extra 40% accuracy. These are due to the men's and women's game being in different levels, at different stages of development. <clears throat> and what do we mean by that? And where did it come from? Well, Godan already told us about the history of the women's game. Um, you know, it all starts with kind of the bands and the way that the governing bodies of football try to suppress women's football. Um, and, and in that time, women's football had to fight just to exist and just for the right, <laughs> just for the right to be a thing. Um, and what does that mean for the sport? Well, it means that for a few decades, men's football is developing, supported by the federations, supported by investment, and women's football in the best case is standing still, but in the worst case is going backwards because it's losing all its players and it's losing all its talent because it doesn't have the resources to keep going. <clears throat> and this kind of history of resistance and subversiveness that belongs to the women's game, that is part of the culture, we think is, is telling us not just an explanation of why maybe technically um, it's uh, women's football is at a disadvantage over men's because for decades it couldn't go on, but also something about fair play. There's an argument there that women, when they come onto the pitch, their opponents are of course rivals, but in some sense also allies because they, they have a camar camaraderie between themselves and they are all fighting for the betterment of the women's game and pursuing a common cause, which is like to progress the sport forward. Um, and <clears throat> so we talk about the history, we, women's football was banned by the federations. And what does that mean? 
It means that for a few decades it didn't exist. And when it comes back into play, what, what's the what's the effect on, on how society talks about women's football, how society perceives women's football? It's not uncommon even today when, when women's football becomes more and more celebrated that for people to refer to men's football, not, not as men's football, but as football. And women's football is something else. It needs this special prefix of women's football as if it's not belonging to the family of football. As if football is defined by, it's of course played by men, um, and women's football is something else on the side, and certainly inferior to the men's game. And what that tells us is that we've all kind of been exposed to this, these uh, signals from society that women's football is something less than. And uh, there's a very nice study from the University of Zurich, which looked into this about the perceptions of people who are observing uh, women's and men's matches. And it showed that when, when flips were anonymized uh, of men's and women's football, they were rated more or less the same in terms of quality. So people observing matches where they didn't know if the clips were from men's football or women's football would rate them more or less the same. And when they could tell the sexes, they would rate on average the men's higher. So <laughs> this is telling us something about the way that we come at women's football with a different set of expectation and perceptions. <clears throat> and what's also feeding into that is the way that women's football is being presented to us in the media, which is, first of all, not that much. <laughs> um, and as we know, uh, of all media coverage of sports, women's sports is getting 10% of the coverage. And not only that, it's not only about quantity, it's also about quality. Oftentimes, coverage of women's football has been unhelpful and has been designed in a way to make women players, to really lean into the femininity of the women players as something that can be sold to a male audience, as something that may be attractive or entertaining for males to watch and observe, um, rather than focusing on the merits of the athletes and, and really um, the sporting aspect, which is very, very different to what's happening in coverage of the, of the men's game. And we argue that the, these three, these three elements uh, create an environment which holds women's football back because we have, they, they allow for a lack of professionalization in the women's game, first and foremost because of the bans, withholding funds from women's football. And, and, and even to this day, I mean, we just had a very amazing Women's World Cup, but Many of the players who um, participated in that are actually not fully professional and need side jobs in order to continue to play football. Even of those who are fully professional, many of them struggle to get by. And in the best case of, of fully professional players who earn a decent living, they're usually training within an environment in a club, which is providing better infrastructure to the men's team than the women's in terms of pitches, equipment, doctors, physios, and the whole thing. <clears throat> and, um, and what this also means is that if you take all these three backdrops together and include the lack of professionalization, we, we end up with a smaller talent pool within women's football than in men's football, because why should, why should women play football at all when they can't sustain themselves on average and earn a decent wage with financial security and on top of that, the negative perceptions of society in general, and also um, the fact that there are anyway barriers to entry because you can always find a club which takes boys to play, but finding one which takes women to play or girls to play is oftentimes a challenge. Um, <clears throat> and, and then the way media reports about football and the lack of engagement of society in women's football is also meaning that it attracts less revenues, and that's the age-old argument for why it's attracting less investment from the outside, which then feeds into a vicious cycle, which is um, preventing further professionalization and development of the women's game. So this is how we <laughs> understand the story of, of women's football, but also the meaning of the results that we've, we've attained, that yes, we can distinguish between the sex, between matches of women and men, even after controlling for um, physical differences between the sexes, but <laughs> this, this topic is so gendered and it's so political and 
and it, it does no one any favors to pretend that it's not the case and to pretend or to pretend that it's a fair kind of comparison so um <clears throat> i'll start to slowly wrap up <laughs> um what have we found from this challenge board? What have we learned during the presentation? So first and foremost, football is a physical game <laughs> um, and many different aspects of the game are interdependent with each other. There's more physical aspects and less physical aspects, but in the end, they're more or less all interrelated and controlling for physical difference is a challenge. But it is possible and we, we gave our best attempt and that resulted in a model of logistic regression with some features that we argue are more or less not physically biased and um, with an accuracy of 90% roughly. Um, so it is possible to differentiate between men's matches and women's matches to relatively high accuracy. And the most important features were, as we said, round pass success rate, time wasting and cards received. And we argue that the most important thing to take away from all of this is that the differences that we observe are a result of the different stages of development in the women's game. <clears throat> when it comes to things that we could do to build on this work, I think it all comes down to one key point, which is this was a very interesting question to some extent, but it opens up more questions. And What's important is to keep asking the right questions and always try to ask better questions and be critical about the results that you obtain. So the idea was to make the comparison more fair. That's my interpretation in the way. That was our interpretation by controlling for physical differences. But because of the vast inequality in investments and the vast inequality as a result of the history of uh, women's football and men's football, we think it might be actually very interesting to do a more like for like comparison where we compare between either fully professional leagues or leagues which have similar similar investments and this would also allow us for a larger sample site because there are more matches going on in a league season than in a world cup and what would be very very interesting is to see how this result how our model results would evolve through time if we were to keep doing this for like subsequent world cups does it get better as in does the accuracy decrease <laughs> and and do we do we see a tendency for uh, the women's game to become more and more like the men's game or and we argue that the women's women's football does have a choice to make here does it want to be like the men's game or does it like the kind of subversive resistance culture inclusive culture that is built and does it want to continue and forge its own way and so it would be very interesting to see how these things develop over time um, and I'll, I'll now make a closing remark, which is, um, as I said, ask the right questions. So we know that we can distinguish between the sectors when it comes to football matches, but just ask ourselves, like, what does it mean? <laughs> How do we get there? And is there anything we can do to make things better? Thank you. Questions? Yeah. Uh, first of all, thanks, beautiful work, and just to talk also to put everything in context. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, are you publishing this somewhere? <laughs> We're publishing it. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, um, there's no like concrete plan to publish it in, in the near future, but for sure it's a topic we're super interested in, all of us also very passionate about, and um, yeah, <laughs> maybe at some point in the future, we can look into it, yeah. Uh, the, the other question was just, maybe you said it, I misheard it somewhere or so, but compared to a little bit, uh, first of all, um, there is a clear difference in pass accuracy currently. Mm -hmm. So how did you so why is it not significant to or how did you compensate it away to or explain it with um physical problem? I think mm -hmm. that uh, why the pass accuracy is not significant. So the, the pass accuracy is significant, but we only considered ground passes and distinguished uh, between whether they are pressured or not. And we argue that on the professional level, we assume 
or expect that the, the physical differences uh, do not make a difference on the professional level. Maybe on yeah. on um, on the beginner's level for sure, but the ground part is the very basic part of um, they should not make a difference. The physical. Yeah. And pressure. Yeah. So here it's not there. It's not thinking. Very well. So the ground pass goal kick. A goal kick. That's the goal kick. Passing with the permission to have the first time. Yeah, yeah. So was the question what was the question about I, I understood part. Okay. 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 Then we go back to the I have a first of all, great presentation, really, and great conclusion. And also I like very much your way to like put the, the physical advantages by the way with this diagram with this tree. And um, but still, I want to be just a little picky. And uh, I mean, the, the question was uh, also to make a workflow which differs between men and women's football and also not using advantages in, to, in training facilities, right? And now, for example, Miss Control yeah. has a struggle. It's a big thing which can be trained. And mm -hmm. it's uh, how do you like, could it be maybe improved by weighing those? Uh, those features with uh, training, mm. you know, how how mm. can you train this one, or yeah, how would you? Uh, yeah, further? you want to actually? Yeah, I mean, so the thing is that um, we know that the kind of brief was don't include this kind of stuff, but we kind of went against that because we wanted to make the point that's important because that's kind of the story, um. The thing is, yeah, you could, you could somehow weight it, but with the with the data that we have, I think it would be challenging without supplementing it with some kind of data about training or professionalization or whatever. Um, yeah, but we kind of a little bit rebelled against the brief, which is we wanted to get out the biological differences, but make the point really about um, the development of the game and the, tra and the training does matter and we should talk about it. I mean, it's yeah. also to do with the investment. Sure, yeah. Yeah. It was also nice. Yeah. No, but it's a good point. Um, I guess with the data we have, it would be difficult without just completely excluding it. Uh, and then, yeah. Do you have a question? 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 Do you have Maybe, who knows? The thing is that the thing I think the point really is there was so much damage done in the women's game. We don't know kind of what's what's do you know what I mean? It's like um now we try to compare men's and women's football as if as if just by undoing the bands everything is okay. Um it doesn't work like that. But yeah, yes, potentially if you invest more, if 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 players become more professional, they're able to drop their side jobs. And more than that, maybe they can afford a chef, like most professional male footballers can, or they don't have to worry about buying shoes that are made for women or for men. You know what I mean? What are the actual advantages of the game? Um, um, I don't know, but I would uh, refer to the first presentation, <laughs> uh, which claimed around eighty-five-ish percent for men and more like seventy percent for women, roughly. But we were measuring something a little bit different, which is just ground passes. Um, pressure on pressure, but yes. Yeah, sorry. Um, I'm originally the analyst from Nigeria. They were being in this one, you guys are here. It's actually very inspiring to see what's this I'm really committed to the vision style. Mm -hmm. and my last was really presented on the So my question is more generic, like, would it be biased to consider because when you think about like men and women, would be too biased to consider like statistics in terms of like um, um, best players, like um, categories for best players, like what are their statistical requirements, the non biological practices, this is what we will cover the biological aspects. Would be considered that in your analysis? Would it be biased? 
Um, I'm not sure I got that. Did you want to? So you, you did analysis on the team level. Yes. The question would be, what about the outstanding players? Are there uh -huh. there? So, so just to just be concrete, <laughs> you, you mean uh -huh, you mean if we just considered the best performing players and and and. Uh -huh. Yeah. Can you, can you give one example? For example, you know Messi. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know Atiana, Messi, and Angel. Yeah. 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 Ye
So when, when the bottom half is mixed mm -hmm. up, then maybe you can do your argument just the first 70 minutes or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because when the endurance goes yeah. down, yeah. yeah. Did you have a look or? Um, so we had a look at um, some of those matches which were falsely classified. So what mm -hmm. what was the reason for that? And there we could really see that they were like overperforming in the passing accuracy, and which were often yeah, and yeah. for the females. And um, those were the matches where you had like very very good teams against like um low performing teams and then of course the high performing team has more often the ball and then you end up with the higher accuracy yeah but we interpret it as like showing just the difference also in the variance of the of the football teams of the female like what what's the current stage okay other questions I have none online. So if there are no other questions, I'm going to put the actual ones. Thank you. This could be good if one can. Yes. Yeah. Like that. Thank you so much. Thank you. And of course, this one we appreciated the uh and the accuracy of the research in the literature and the whole uh correctness in the implementation. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, uh, I think with that we can conclude. Um, yeah, for the ones online, we we will meet each other again at the next uh, Data Connect. And for here, thank you for being here. Thank you for particip participating. Thank you for uh, being in the challenge. Thank you to the Professor Brandes for hosting us uh, for the challenge. It was a lot of fun, and I have to say one of the most successful topics we've ever had. Thank you. <laughs>